Part three of the tubes. Talk about changing the tubes. So we've talked about the gray tubes. We talked about house branding, and now we're going to talk about changing tubes. So the 12AY7 is your first stage preamp. The 12AX7 is the second stage preamp after the tone stack, and then it's also the phase inverter that then goes to the 6V6GT power tubes that are in push-pull operation. The 12AY7 preamp is a low gain tube. The amp volume is about 85 to 90 dB at 3 feet. It's loud, but it's not loud. It's loud, but you can play and sing along with it. It has incredible clarity to it, but it's not going... Uh, it, it's a good practice amp, if you will. Actually, it's a good small stage amp, small stage, small venue amp. Uh, if you want to go busk with this thing on the street, this is the amp to have, because it'll put out 15 watts. 10 watts is a little anemic at times. Five, five watts won't do it at all, but if you're into uh, busking, uh, this is great at 15 watts. You, a guitar, and uh, the amp. Great combination. Uh, amongst all the other noise it, it, uh, of a band, it, you won't hear it as much. You would have to mic it up. But you can swap in a 12AX7 and get a little bit more volume out of it. Uh, another 5 dB on the C scale. The output will max out at 20 watts. I've measured that. It cuts the bandwidth in half. The frequency bandwidth gets cut when you go up to a 12AX7. I'm going to explain that today. It's something to consider. A lot of people don't think about that, but it's something to consider because that in itself changes or can change the uh, tone of the amp. It sort of depends on the instrument, your playing style, how you've tuned up, and where you are on the center frequency for the bandwidth of that tube in this amp. It may completely make no change, uh, change to you, or it may change you in a way you don't like it. So the 12AX7 will increase the output from 15 to 20 watts measured. Uh, the output transformer will overheat. Notice this heat mark. Somewhere before I received it, I received it with a 12AY7 in it, but someone must have been passed, put a 12AX7, because you put a 12AX7 in there, this thing gets hot at 20 watts. So a sine wave, the way this amp operates, a sine wave, uh, small signal in, as long as you're only driving the amp to 10 watts, sine wave in, sine wave out. And we start uh, up to about 150 millivolts. You go over 150 millivolts to about 250 millivolts, it starts to clip. It goes from a sine wave to a really rounded one, uh, flat tops, bottoms. Uh, the output transformer starts getting warm, not hot. It gets warm. But when you put in a 12AX7, you drive it above 15 watts, you're putting in, say, uh, a definite 300 to 500 millivolts into the input. You've driven the output uh, to a, a square wave. The tubes don't have a chance to cool down. They're pumping all their power into the output transformer, and the output transformer becomes a heat sink. And it transfers that heat to the chassis, and you can see the result thereof. It produces this heat mark. That's because somewhere in its past, it was played for a while with 12AX7 in it. Did it uh, do damage over time? No, it still plays. But someone uh, put back in a 12AY7 because that w was original. It's a good uh, step back. It's not as loud. Nice clarity, as I said. But a 12AX7 will do this, so there's a risk there. How long will this output transformer really uh, run? I don't know. It must have played for years just fine. There's some risk there. Preamp changes the frequency bandwidth. You get a tube and you go, I want more gain. So you go, okay, great. I'm going to put, take out my AT7, put an AX7 in. I'm going to take the AY7 out in this case and put an AX7 in. I'm going to go from a mu of 40, spec sheet, 
mu 40 to a spec sheet of 100. The reason I say spec sheet is only on a spec sheet does this exist. Because in reality, you get 30% of this when you actually build the circuit and you put the components in. It's much less than half. So you're not going to get, you're not getting four, a mu of 40. You're getting a mu of probably somewhere around 15 to 20. For the AY7, for the AX7, you're getting a mu of about 30 to 35, a, a gain of 30 to 35. You're not going to get 100. That's textbook, spec sheet stuff. It's built, it, it really is more of how this tube is built than what it actually will deliver in this case. So here are the calculations. The mu is the transconductance times RP prime. RP prime is the resistance of the plate, the tube, the, uh, the uh, plate resistor, and the load on the plate, RO, the tone stack. Uh, they're all in parallel, and this is how you calculate it. So if I have the plate resistor of 100K and a, and a st tone stack load of 500K, with the fact that the t uh, tube, the AX7, is 62.5, they're all R, then uh, here's my RP prime. We're going, well, and they're a little different all the way down through here. As you can see, here's the RP for each of the tubes, here's the RP prime for each of the tubes, here's the effective mu. Uh, uh, the actual gain out of it, uh, recalculating the, the textbook to here, and then when you put that actually in the circuit, it's going to be less. Like I said, uh, the 12AX7 is more like 30 to 35, not 57. We're not going into more details about that, but look what happens to the bandwidth. The bandwidth is 1 over 2 pi RP prime times C, and I'm going to use a capacitance of 0.02 microfarads as an example because that's typically the uh, blocking capacitor off the plate of the tube. So let's use that value in this example. And when you calculate the bandwidth for 12AU7, you get 1000 hertz. On the certain frequency, 1000 hertz, so it's 500 up or down, that width. And then we go to a higher mu tube, HT7, it decreases a bit. You go to AY7, it decreases almost half again. And you go down to a, a 12AX7 thing, I'm going to get a lot of gain, but your bandwidth goes down. You're going, oh, all is lost. We're hopeless here. We can't be doing this. Well, it's not as bad as you think. It, the, the point to make is it's going to change uh, the tone of the amp based on the way you play and what you're playing. So if in this curve, so I have dB on the vertical axis and a frequency response on the horizontal axis. Here's my 100 hertz line, 1K, 10K. This blue line is the frequency response of the speaker. Uh, as a side note, so it has a Jensen speaker in there, and that's generally what that blue line represents from the Jensen uh, literature for a P12R. Notice that just because it's capable of frequency response in the uh, 3 to 5,000 range doesn't mean you're going to get that because the bandwidth uh, starts hitting 3 dB about here and there, and then once uh, e either side here, it starts dropping off. So if, depending on the resistors and capacitors around the two, how you have designed, if we said that the frequency, center frequency is about here, which is about 400 hertz, uh, either side of that, uh, where it intersects this blue line, is generally about 3 dB down. That is the optimum playing range that it should, the amp is allowing the speaker to do what it does. And then above that point, up in here, while the speaker is capable of more fidelity, the bandwidth for the circuit limits it. It starts um, muting, if you will. It will degrade. It will not allow those frequencies to pass because this becomes a filter. Changing that tube changes the filter characteristics, the frequency filter characteristics in the circuit. Something you need to be concerned with. So the difference between AY7 and AX7 is not as extreme as looking at this. 
because they fall out. So I've put in two dash curves, one for the AY7 and one for the 12 AY7, while it necks down somewhat considerably. In this range, it's still flat in the middle. So you may not notice the change tonally on your amp. But if you're uh, playing down in the more mid to base year range, you're going to notice a drop off. And if you're playing a Telecaster, now this may make a difference. Let's say you're, you're, you're playing a Telecaster and it's fully capable of playing up in this frequency range and it's now dropping off. You may not like that, but it was even with AY7, it's kind of dropping off anyway. But if you're trying to uh, go something higher, uh, say vocals, is going to filter it out. It's like changing that uh, preamp tube is like changing the uh, tone control on the amp. You may have to change the, uh, if you want to keep the high ends, say you put the 12AX7 in and it shifts it down, you may actually have to turn the tone control up to allow more high end to get through and if you're satisfied um, with the mic channel which is not the bright uh, channel but you may have to actually go over to the, the instrument channel which actually has the bright cap you may find yourself rather than playing through the mic channel and being okay you may actually have to transfer over to the instrument channel with the bright cap and turn up the uh, tone control to be brighter for you because you went from an AY7 to an AX7. That is the consequence there. Small adjustment, but it will not be exactly the same and louder. It changes the frequency, bandwidth, and it's like a tone control. If you want to know in summary what happens when you change a tube from an AY7 to an AX7, it's like changing the tone control down. Changing the preamp, so you're swapping with a 12 AX7, bumps up the another 5 dB, uh, it'll max out between 18 and 22 watts. I said 20 before, but you know there's some give and take here. The difference in the plate resistance changes the bandwidth. Let's go back to this. Acts like a tone, uh, tone scoop control. Notice here's the RP, but this is when you change out the RP of the tube. The plate resistance in the tube it is direct. Everything else is the same, but that changes, and this changes the bandwidth, and that's the consequence of changing out that preamp. Let's move on to the power tubes. Six V six listening test. I like this paper that this person at, they they published. They took an amp and they changed out the six V six tubes, different brands, different makes. Uh, the gray tubes, the clear tubes, and they were just listening. No engineering measurements. The tubes are exactly the same between uh, one uh, a clear tube and a gray tube. But then they, they said that the gray tube, the graphite coated tubes, usually preferred. Uh, they, um, but they have their thick fudgy mids and deep bottom and increases the impression of the size in the small amp but when they went to a clear tube they said it sounded thinner and stringier well that's an opinion uh, tubes from one tube to the next from one uh, production run to the next plus or minus 20 percent on the specifications those tube curves aren't precision they grab a tube out of a production run run a tube curve they publish that and generally it'll be there plus or minus 20 percent they depending on which production run for that tube you, you get and you have no control over they could have said the same said the same thing the other way that the clear tube gave gave them a more lower mid-range and base and the gray tube sounded thinner and stringier it's more of uh, the result of the production run of the tube than it is the graphite coating because the graphite coating does not change the characteristic of the tube. It's only a shield. It would be equivalent to this. If you were to take like the preamp tube and put the metal shield around it, what have you changed? Nothing. It's still the same tube. You've put a shield around it. 
So rather, they didn't put that shield around the gray tube because they would get that tube too hot. So they put the gray shielding as a compromise between the co allowing the tube to cool more and the metal to, uh, shield, because they put the metal shield on there, they would end up having to put a fan in there to get the forced draft to keep the tube cool. Other than that, the gray tube and the clear tube are exactly the same. So depending which tube you get in a production run, it can make a difference either being sounding uh, good mid-range or thinner and stringy. It's very subjective. It's not an engineering thing. It's just a luck of the draw as to which tube you got. So should I buy matched tubes? Let's go into that. If one of the tubes uh, fails, your best bet always is to replace both the tubes. Because if one failed, the other one's probably close behind. You won't have much uh, luck with it. And you really want to try to get two new tubes, uh, same make, same model, and you're trying to get the same lot. Well, back then, you could probably look at the box and get the uh, you can get the lot number and this particular I'm looking at a tube here they don't have the lot number but some of the other tubes uh, when you doing ham radio work you can look at the you can get a lot number and say I want two tubes that have the same production run so they're matched uh, not so much here but try to get two fresh new tubes same year two 1959's two 1976's whatever, two uh, 2021s, uh, get a new tube, get a match. That'll be the best thing you can do to match the tubes. So first of all, Fender didn't match tubes. They're being mass produced, uh, right spec, I need 1,066 GTs, you pull two, you put them in the amp, put them in the next amp, put them in the next amp, and you just keep plugging them in, selling them, oh, right of uh, RCAs, we're gonna put tongue soles in, and away you go. All the thought there was to it in the 50s. In the 50s. So, what is a match tube? It's it's not what you think it is. There's a lot of thing, uh, uh, rhetoric out in the, in the web saying, uh, you know, get a match tube. Well, what does that mean? Identical looking tubes are not matched. They just look the same. Uh, if you they can give them within the same year, that's about as close to match as you're going to get. I need two 59s, I need two 67s, I need two, but don't get a 59 and a 67, they're, they're not going to be matched as close as you want because the plus or minus 20% thing is good for a particular time and, uh, along the way. So as the quality control over the years changes, you want them to be kind of the same. A 59 may be off one way, and a 1967 tube will be off the other way. But two of the same year are going to be as close as you're going to get. So, the match tube is a misnomer. All the sellers can do today when they match the tube is to match the plate current to be within 5% generally of the claim. What that does is it makes the bias setting easier if you're not on a common cathode uh, arrangement for your push-pull um, and you have to set two different biases, uh, it makes setting it easier. You, whatever you figure out for one tube is going to apply to the other. On a common cathode, not so much. You just want to get the same year for both tubes. This is all they can do. They can possibly match the GM, but you may actually match the uh, transconductance for both tubes, but the plate current's going to be off. The RP may be off. From one year to the next, within a production run, the plate, the anode uh, resistance will be somewhat the same because they're stamping out those plate anode plates the same way, but as they change that design over time, the plate resistance is going to change over time. If you change the plate resistance, even in a power tube, you're going to change the bandwidth of the frequency response of that power tube, and they're going to sound different. You can't match the, always the GM, the gain, the mu, the tube curves. Two curves will never match. If you were to actually put one in a test stand and actually run the curves on an oscilloscope, uh, this year run and that year run are going to be, they should look similar, but they're not going to be exactly the same. If you really want a matched tube, the tube curves 
need to be identical. There's no way. Not any. Not everyone has that, nor will they give that to you because they just they just don't have the equipment. So the best thing you can do is purchase two tubes of the same production lot and buy that of the same year that they were manufactured. <clears throat> Changing the 6V6 tubes, again, graphite shield, brand new tubes, doesn't affect the tone. The timber of the amp, this is the reason you want to replace two at the same time because the timber of the amp uh, is governed by the power delivered by the power tube. Uh, much like uh, the timbre of a guitar is changed by how the strings are played. Are you playing lightly? Or are you playing heavy? The timbre of the amp, the tubes driving the speakers, will change. That's it. Uh, other thing to point out, uh, always never change the 6V6 with the 6L6. That would be a mistake because the 6L6 pulls a lot more amps on the plate. And as a result, the transformer is going to try to deliver that. And it's going to try to deliver too many amps to the 6L6. You'll burn out your power transformer. And that would be very unfortunate. Again, match tubes is a misnomer. Six, if the 6V6 were absolutely identical, Let's say you've run the curve, you, you've, you've, you've measured the RP, you've cha you looked at the capacitance uh, values between the plate, the grid, and the cathode, and they were just, for some odd reason, perfectly exactly the same. The phase inverter will distort the signal asymmetrically when the amp is overdriven. And in a future video, I'm going to cover that because the two tubes aren't driven the same way. It's supposed to be a balanced uh, phase splitter. It isn't. It's a big surprise when I hook the uh, oscilloscope up to it and go, this looks really wonky. So even if they're identical, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't spend the time and money on matching the tubes other than getting the same year because that phase inverter does some really wonky stuff with the output. <laughs> and changing the output transformer. That also has a very drastic effect on the sound, and I've got a couple videos on that. I've published uh, videos on the output transformer for my Premier Twin 8 before. What makes a good blues amp transformer? The frequency response of the speaker is governed and dictated by the output transformer. If you take the original 108 out and stick in a cataloged one from a brand name out on the internet and put it in there, whole new ball game. Very different uh, frequency and tonal response. If you could actually get a perfect sine wave out of the power tubes, phase inverter aside, it was the output transformer is going to have a drastic effect on the tone of the, of the amp. And I'm going to cover that later in a couple videos in the future. So thank you for watching.